I encourage you to open your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 31. You can find that on page 31 in the key Bible in front of you, and I encourage you to follow us along. We've been coming through Genesis chapter by chapter, looking at the beginning of God's rescue plan to save the world, what the Bible is communicating to us. And this week we're in Genesis chapter 31. Jacob is finally fleeing from Laban. This is the word of God speaking directly to us this morning. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has gained all this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was, and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, The spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock were four spotted. And if he said, The stripes shall be your wages, then all the flock were striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that made with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes and see all the goats that made with the flock of striped, spotted, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, for you have anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Adam Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods, and Jacob tricked Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had, and arose and crossed the Euphrates, and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. When it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days, and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his henchmen pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done, that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and trick me, and did not tell me, so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre? And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you have gone away because you long greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your God shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours, and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent and did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry that I cannot arise before you, for the way of the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. 
Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my gods. What have you found of all your household goods? I'm oh, sorry. For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? Said here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was by day, the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now he would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters of my daughters, the children of my children, the flocks are my flocks. And all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters, or for their children whom you have born? They have born. Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I. And let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called the Jagorat Sahotafah. But Jacob called it Galilee. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he named it Galit and Mizpah. For he said, The Lord watch between you and me, when we are out of one another's sight. If you oppress my daughters, or take, or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and the pillar which I have set between you and me? This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you, and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of their father judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, and Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, let this word sink into us. Be near to us with this word. Let to see your redemption in it so that our relationships between each other reflect more and more the loving, kind, gracious relationship you have with us through the gospel. The actions for you Well, it's probably no surprise to any of us that relationships are difficult, aren't they? Just depending on what it is that makes them hard, creates a severity. There's, the, there's a severity of difficulty on relationships, depending on the context and what the problem is. Even the best relationships, they can sour, unfortunately. Sometimes it doesn't take very long, unfortunately. One part of theology that's not often talked about enough, I don't think, is the noetic effects of sin. So what the noetic effects of sin are, are, are how our fallen nature affects us mentally, it affects how we think, and that effect that the fallen nature has upon us and how we think affects our knowledge, it affects how we perceive things, including relationships. None of us are perfect in how we perceive other people around us because of our fallen nature. But that means then that our relationships have already a disadvantage against them in how we perceive each other if we don't perceive each other perfectly because sometimes, if we're honest, we are intentional in relationships to do harm. Or other people are intentional in relationships to do us harm. And they do know what they're doing. That's what sin does. And the more that sin builds in relationships, the more 
compounded the issues are and the more hurt spreads around us in relationships and it becomes really, really difficult to navigate. The context can become so thick that we don't often see where we need to even start repenting in relationships because of the compounding nature of sin. So what makes relationships difficult though? When you think in your own life about difficult relationships that you may have, what makes those relationships so hard to deal with? There are many things, aren't there? From this lack of, this lack of nuance, not allowing people to be themselves. If everything is either black or white, we're gonna have a real hard time in relationships because people are nuanced. People don't always listen to us in the specific way we want them to listen, or people aren't always speaking in the specific way we want them to speak in a relationship. There's no nuance. And so it makes a relationship really, really difficult when it lacks nuance. Or another way to say it is, it lacks grace. If we're lacking grace in a relationship, it can make it difficult. Not giving people the benefit of the doubt. That can cause a lot of harm in relationships when we're not giving people the benefit of the doubt. Using policies as a sledgehammer on people. Rather than allowing policies to, to serve us in ways that are good, it's really easy to disregard someone else's conscience by taking some sort of policy or some sort of rule and just slicing through their conscience without any regard for what they believe or any regard for, for where they came from or, or who they are. We can do that really, really quickly in relationships. If we're not careful, sometimes what we can do is we can use policies to push people out. This happens in companies, it happens in organizations, it can happen in church. Or if there's someone you don't like, just use a policy and push them out. Or you can use a policy to do the opposite. You can promote them. No questions asked. Well, that's the policy. That's what can happen in relationships if we're not careful. And it makes relationships really, really difficult. Ultimately, I do think if you could take everything that makes a relationship difficult and you put it under one big umbrella, that umbrella of what really makes all relationships difficult is when we fail, like all of us are prone to do, to love others the way God has loved us. When we fail to love others the way that God has loved us in the gospel, it is going to create a problem in our relationships. Well, here we are at the middle of or sort of the middle of the book of Genesis, a little beyond it, where we're seeing some really difficult relationships here. I mean, if you can't tell at this point, Jacob's relationship with Laban is just in shambles. Okay, it is a major problem in the story. You've got Leah's relationship with Rachel, her, and God is really the only one who's providing any sort of glue or stability in these relationships so that any kind of redemption can come out of this. Because these relationships are broken. But yet in the brokenness, it's the loving presence of God's grace. And it is there. It's all throughout the passage where we see that in God's loving kindness, His presence is the thing that's going to mend these broken relationships. And there's really four significant truths that Jacob has to be believing that are revealed right here in the passage to help him see that God is the one who can mend what's broken in a relationship. And the four truths that we see about God that we need to be believing in our broken relationships, when we have relationships that are very, very difficult, are number one, we need to see God is with us. God is with you. In the midst of a broken relationship. The second thing we need to see is God provides for us. God provides for you in the midst of a difficult, trying relationship. The third thing we need to see is that God sees you. God sees us. He knows what's going on in the midst of the difficult relationship. And then finally, we need to see that God gives you a covenant of peace. God gives you a covenant of peace to have and to use. In the midst of a broken relationship. It's these four reasons, these four truths that we need to be trusting in who God is so that God's presence is manifested in the midst of the horror that the hurt can bring on of a difficult, problematic, broken relationship. And it's really a reminder that at the moment you feel isolated because the relationship's difficult or you feel polarized, in the midst of a broken relationship, whether that relationship's in your house, 
whether that relationship is with someone at church or someone at work, know this, God's presence is right there. Each one of these truths, the way that they're described in the text, and we'll look at this in a moment, is right after the, the horror of what's broken about the relationship has been described. So you've got, throughout the passage, the description of the problem, and then glued right next to it, like a Lego piece sticking right onto it, is the grace of God and who God is in the midst of that brokenness. So no matter how polarized you feel, know that God is sticking with you in the midst of that difficult relationship. So let's look at the first thing we need to be believing. What's the first thing we need to be believing in the midst of a relationship that's problematic, difficult, or broken? Look at verse 4 with me. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before. It's an interesting way to describe a problematic relationship, isn't it? But the God of my father has been with me. You know that I served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not permit him to harm me. So what's the first thing we need to see from this passage about God? We need to see that God is with you. He's with you. It's interesting how he's describing the relationship as being unfavorable. Would you describe that in some of your relationships? They don't favor you like they used to, or you don't favor them anymore. Maybe you're in a meeting at work and you lost favor in that meeting. You went into it feeling pretty good. You walked out of it feeling really bad because you didn't have favor anymore like you thought you had. Or a meeting at church. Lots of meetings go that way. You walk in that meeting sensing like you have favor. You walk out feeling like you've got none. You don't have favor anymore with those people. Or maybe it was at home or wherever it was, you lost favor. They didn't regard you with favor anymore. When I was a kid, one of my favorite movies, this is still one of my favorite movies, is the movie Hook. If you're not familiar with the movie Hook, it's the story of Peter Pan. Peter Pan becomes an adult. And he ends up going back to Neverland because his kids were taken captive. We're not going to go through the whole movie. Right? He goes back to Neverland because his kids are captured. And he's got to discover that he's Peter Pan because he doesn't believe he is. And so he's with the Lost Boys. And one of the Lost Boys who's leading the pack of boys now that Peter Pan's been gone is Rufio. Rufio's leading the Lost Boys. And they're all on his side. And what he ends up doing is he draws a line in the sand takes a sword, draws a line in his hands, and he says, whichever one of you believes that this man is Peter Pan, cross that line. So they have this back and forth until eventually all the boys cross that line, and Rufio is the one who's left standing all alone. And we can feel that way in relationships. We feel like someone's drawing a line. We don't intend to draw a line. We're just trying to figure something out. Someone's drawing this line in the sand. Which side are people going to stand on? They're going to side with you? Or are they going to stay on the other side of the line? That's what it feels like to lose favor with others. And it creates problems in relationships. You know, here's a side note. I was thinking about this as I was praying through this passage of scripture this week. Side note, be careful treating people with no favor. Just be careful. Because what you can do is you can unintentionally put a yoke of burden on them where they feel isolated, even though that may not be your intention, if you're treating them with disfavor. But maybe you've been left standing on that line where someone wasn't treating you with the kind of favor that you were hoping for, and you feel alone. What should you be believing if you're on that side of the line? God is with you. God is with you. So many times in the New Testament, Jesus describes the nearness of God's presence in the life of a believer. If you're trusting in Jesus, that he died on the cross for you to give you an eternal relationship with God. There's no more barrier between you and God. Your sins are forgiven. You're welcomed into God's presence happily. God wants to enjoy you in his presence. If that's you, hear what Jesus says is true of you from John 14. This is what he prays for you. He says, 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But then it says this, but you know him. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. That's how near God is to you. If you're feeling like you're polarized in a difficult relationship, that's how near God is. He's dwelling in you by the power of the Spirit. If you've been crucified with Christ, you no longer live. Christ lives in you, the Bible says. Then you've been blessed. You've been blessed. We all have. With a friend that's closer to us than a brother or sister. Closer to us than blood that never leaves our side. Is always with us. And takes everything that's good about God and manifests it to us. This is why when we're praying for people who are in a hospital, who feel alone physically, they might also feel alone spiritually or emotionally or relationally. They might feel like no one can sympathize with them. We're always praying, aren't we? I am for God's presence to be near to them. Because it's the power of God's presence that will help them when they're feeling those things. Hmm. When you think about the grace of God and the gospel, the nearness of God doesn't depend on us, does it? It's not because we're better people. It's not because we're wiser. It's not because we're good. It's all because of God's grace. He simply chooses to be loving towards us and chooses for his spirit to dwell in us. We just need to just rest. Rest in him, right? When the Bible calls us to have childlike faith, that faith is the same kind of faith that my children have whenever they're crying and hurting, and I just pick them up, and they are as limp as a rag doll in my arms, trusting in me to provide for them. That's the kind of faith God wants us to have. So we can know the power of his presence is with us, even in our darkest hours with us. God is with you. What's the second thing we should be believing? God provides for you. Look at verse 14. It says, Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. I doubt there isn't a soul here this morning that hasn't been regarded as a foreigner at one time or another. What an interesting way to describe a difficult relationship. You're regarded, even by those closest to you, as a foreigner. Kids, let me ask you this. You're going to go home for lunch today. Or is it dinner? What's it called around here anyway? But you're going to go home, right? Imagine walking home feeling really, really hungry, and your parents are there sitting at the table, eating themselves silly, and you say, hey, can I have some food? Can I have some lunch? And they say, we don't know you. You're a foreigner. That's how Laban was regarding his daughters. He was taking everything that even belonged to them and using it for himself. Have you been regarded as a foreigner? Do you feel homeless? That's how foreigners feel. Now we would say maybe sometimes we don't feel like a foreigner with physical things. Maybe we have our physical needs provided for. But how many of us even in church can feel like a foreigner spiritually? We feel like a foreigner relationally. Emotionally. We can feel like a foreigner. It doesn't have to be physical. You can feel relationally foreign to people all around you. You can have a whole city of millions of people around you and feel alone. Or you can have a city of 2,000 people around you and feel alone. You feel homeless. The relationships are difficult. We can do this in church. Whenever we're not showing basic hospitality to others, we can make them feel homeless, sort of. That's the last thing they should be feeling. We want them to not feel like that. This is why we talk to them about the gospel and know that through the gospel they can have an eternal home with God and then be a part of God's people. 
It's a huge cause for us to be sharing the gospel. Does that motivate you? Do you are you motivated to share the gospel? Not because you know that you should, but because you don't want people around you to feel like a foreigner to God. You want them to feel welcomed and at home with God. That should be motivating us every day to be communicating the grace of God and the gospel. The last place on earth that Christians who already believe the gospel should feel like foreigners in is with other brothers and sisters in Christ at church. We should feel at home because we all have the same father. We are all part of the same, the Bible would describe as household of faith in Ephesians 2. So when we gather together in Jesus' name, we should feel like we belong to Jesus and belong to each other. Even if we have differences, when we have differences in the local church, it's not the same thing as when you see differences in the world. Our world, our culture, America, is constantly being more and more polarized because of little differences. Don't let the internet know what differences you have with other people. Or you're going to feel like a foreigner everywhere if you're not careful. We should push against that with the redemption of Christ with a grace, with a love, even despite differences, when we have unity in Christ, when it's Jesus' blood shed for all of us that gives us the love of God that we can be rallying around. Maybe it's a sign of what we're rallying around if we're not experiencing that unity. Maybe we have our priorities messed up. Maybe Jesus isn't really the center if we're constantly feeling polarized by one another in the local church. This is why we need to be centered on Christ. This is why I'm preaching and teaching and focusing all of our ministries on what the gospel is and our relationships on what the gospel is doing in our relationships. Because it's through the gospel, isn't it? It's through the gospel. When you're feeling like a foreigner, like Rachel and Leo were, what happens? Well, God steps in, doesn't he? It says, God, in verse 16, has taken away from our father belong, what belongs to us and to our children. So they tell Jacob, do whatever God says to you to do. Because that's what ended up happening. God provides for Jacob and for his offspring so they can go into the land, the goats and the sheep, all by the work of Jacob's hands. And it's through that means that we saw, remember the sticks last week? How confusing was that? Like how the sticks are used to breed the flocks. God he actually used that what we would call normal means of grace to produce a wealth through Jacob's efforts so that he is the provider for them. They don't have to rely on Laban in the midst of this difficult relationship. They can rely on God. What do you need this morning in the midst of the difficult relationship where you might feel like a foreigner? What do you need? Where are you going to get that need met? Do you need wisdom? God provides you with wisdom. God promises to give wisdom to any of his children who would ask. Do you need an advocate? That's what foreigners need. Maybe you need one. An advocate who pleads your case. Maybe injustice has been done to you. I need someone to plead your case and overturn the injustice. Do you need justice appeased? God will be your advocate. God provides that for you. God hates injustice. It's throughout the whole Bible. He's constantly, we sang about it this morning, he's constantly calling for his people to be just with one another. God promises to be your advocate. You may not know his timing, but his timing is always perfect. Psalm 140, 12 promises this, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. That's our God. That's the one we're calling to to provide for us when we're in the midst of a really difficult relationship. Do you need a friend? That's what we need, don't we? Whenever I worked in Louisville, I said I've told this story before, but we had so many refugees come through there because Louisville was one of the sanctuary cities. And even when I moved to Greeley, that was a sanctuary city too. And what you would see when people would be standing there right off the plains, you would see a person who had nothing. They, they had a shirt, a t-shirt that the agency had given them that went down to about right here. It's just this huge shirt. 
And they wouldn't know the language. They wouldn't have, they didn't have anything. And what you could tell just people wanted was a friend. They wanted a friend. Just, and all that comes with that. Think of your best friend. What does your best friend provide for you? All kinds of things, right? We, we could describe it all. It's all of the tangible and intangible qualities of friendship. That's what we need in the midst of a difficult relationship. Do you need a friend? Jesus will be your friend. He will be your friend. Amen. He will walk alongside you. He will listen to you. He will give you compassion. He will help you. He will convict hearts and go before you. And that's what God promised Israel right before they went into the promised land. He said, I will go before you into the promised land. That will be Jesus for you. You don't have to constantly be punching your back and constantly be feeling like you don't belong. When Jesus is on your side, he will provide friendship for you. God provides for you in the midst of a difficult relationship. Number three, God sees you. Look at verse 41. Jacob's rambling to Laban. These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Man, this is a relational nightmare, isn't it? I mean, look what's going on here. Can you imagine being robbed of your wages? So let's say you chose to work on Monday morning. You're feeling good. You just had a good, what quarter are we in? I don't even know. I'm not a businessman. We're in some kind of quarter. We got guys who watch this stuff. You show up. You had a good quarter. You come in. And they say, hey, instead of receiving your wages that you've normally been receiving, you're going to get half for the rest of the year. What's going on? What? Yeah. Yeah. And then imagine that happening to you for the next 20 years. That's what's going on. And yet, in the midst of this frustration, we've got verse 42, don't we? God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. It's like someone who's stealing money from you when you go to school, kids. You got your lunch money? I don't even think they use lunch money anymore. I mean, it's all online. But you used to, you go to school, this happened to me a few times. I remember one time I went to middle school and I didn't take my lunch money that money that day. I had brought my sack lunch. It's a true story. Don't feel sorry for me. It's okay. I've done horrible things now. But I, I, got, I got my lunch out and I was ready to go and some guy grabbed it and like tore it open like from my hands and then started punching me in the arm. You know? We used to give each other called it like the frog or whatever. You know? He's like frog in my arm. What a horrible day. You know? And all my lunch was laid on the ground and he and a bunch of other guys just took it and ran off. What do you need in that moment? You need God to see you. And he does see you. All those details, they're not left to the universe to figure out. God sees every detail of what has happened to you in the midst of a broken relationship. He knows. And he's not frustrated or caught off guard or, or worried about it. He will act on your behalf. He will help you. And that day, he did help me by a nice lunch lady that I didn't even know who gave me not only my lunch for that day, but that little extra cupcake on the side. That's what I needed. It's a little bit of extra grace there is what God did. Even in the midst of the most difficult relationship, God will act because he sees what's happening. When you think about the early church, they had so many relational problems. And God saw them all. And he acted. Ananias and Sapphira is a really prominent one where they were withholding money from the church. And God saw that. Peter tells them as much. And they dropped like that. Because God acted. The church in Ephesus, they were a faithful congregation. They had held, upheld sound doctrine. They were doing a lot of things the right way. And yet, they weren't loving one another. The way that they were called to love one another over and over and over again. And in Revelation, Jesus says, I see you. I see your lack of love. And I will come and remove your lampstand. 
I will act. Because he sees you. He sees. Hebrews 4.13 says this. No creature is hidden from the sight of God. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God holds all people accountable. It's another strong motivation to be showing others and telling others about Jesus. Because God will hold them accountable. God sees them. Why do we volunteer our time and invest all we've got in gospel-centered ministry? Because God sees all things. He knows what's going on, and he acts on what he sees. God sees you in the midst of a difficult relationship. Number four, God gives you a covenant of peace. So we're going to start this in verse 44, but if you follow the story, Laban eventually hunts Jacob down, doesn't he? And when he hunts him down, you have the climax of their conflict coming to fruition. And what ends up happening is he wants a covenant. He wants a something that would be a semblance of peace so that he can kiss his daughters goodbye. So we see this in verse 44. Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. And he does. But then notice the end of the covenant. What was the result of the peace between Laban and Jacob? Look at verse 55. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. It's an amazing end to the covenant. It was through the covenant that created a peace that allowed him to be able, one last time, to kiss those that he did love. The greatest conflict that any of us can experience in a relationship is between us and God. And Jesus satisfied that conflict with a covenant that's so much better than this one. It's a covenant sealed by his blood because Jesus' body received the conflict, didn't it? I mean, there's a sense in which the wrath that stood against us was embodied by Christ on the cross when he became sin. He just died for sin. He, it says he became sin on the cross and was slaughtered so that there's no more hostility between us and God. Perfect peace. We have perfect union with God. And it's not based upon our subjective experience. It's an objective witness, isn't it? The same as it is here. They can look at a pillar and say, this is the witness that stands for us. That's Christ. A pillar that stands forever as an objective witness to the peace you and I have with God so that we can't experience the kiss of God. We can't experience his love and his affection. He's removed all the punishments that stood against us. When a conflict arises in the New Testament, the apostles don't form a community. What the apostles do whenever there's a conflict in the New Testament, and they don't ignore it, they talk about it through the context of Christ's love. They actually use the covenant Christ has established with them in the gospel to resolve the conflict. So you see the apostles in the midst of conflict talking about the love of Christ, talking about the sacrifice of Christ so that we can forbear with one another. You see the apostles talking about forgiveness that's offered to us in Christ so we can forgive one another. They talk about having a humble perspective that's cultivated by gratitude because of what Christ has done in the gospel to remove pride in relationships. That's how they solve these problems. The hope of eternal life, the guarantee of the gospel is another way that they help those. There were, there were people in, in Thessalonica that were experiencing a conflict because they were worried about their loved ones who died. So how did he help them in the midst of those relationships? He gave them the hope of eternal life in the gospel as a way of navigating how they can resolve the problems. Discipleship in the local church is not a program. Discipleship in the local church is a culture. It's a culture from the relationships that prioritize the gospel. Would you describe your relationships in the local church as having a gospel priority? Do they prioritize the gospel? Do you ever talk about the spiritual truths of the gospel in your relationships, especially when there's a conflict. 
But the Bible in the New Testament over and over again is trying to show us that it's through the covenant of peace God has established with us that we can have peace with one another. Faith in what Christ accomplished for us, that kind of faith, it's a supernatural faith. That means God has altered us on the inside to make us his friends. That's what's happened. If you have faith, it's not just agreement. You've been changed. There's a supernatural power that has overcome you so that we can live favorably with God. So if God, think about this, bear with me. If God can overcome the greatest problem in the greatest relationship that any of us could ever have, then what could he not do in our relationships with one another? He could do anything. If he can overcome that problem with the peace he's established in the gospel, what can he overcome? What problem do you have in a relationship? Are you still holding on to something? Some offense that you have towards someone or they have towards you that goes back 20 years, 30 years? Jesus is blood to overcome that. He's overcome the hardest part of relating to us by taking our hearts of stone and changing them. No one else can do that. God did it for us in the gospel. He can overcome the brokenness of our relationships. And he does it all by his grace. It's by God's grace. God's grace converts hearts. And if it's converted our hearts, it can convert anyone. I've been reading a lot of studies on secular psychology. One of the things that secular psychologists agree upon is that the human personality cannot change. That's why they teach coping mechanisms with people that have interpersonal problems. Because that, that's all they can do is cope with it. They're not really going to change someone's personality. You may educate the personality a little bit more. God's grace can change your personality. It can change you. It changes who you are. It changes how you think. It changes how you relate. And it can do the same for others in the midst of the difficult relationship you may be in. Or you will have eventually. There is no earthly relationship we have that God cannot change by His grace. Not one. Because He's with us. He provides for us. He sees us. And He gives us a covenant of peace. So what should we do? What should you do with that info? That's great, Paul. Thank you. We should apply it. We should apply it. We take all these reasons for trusting God in the midst of conflict and difficult relationships, and we apply it. So how do we do that? How do we apply it? We've got three reasons, three ways. Number one, one way we can apply it. Have a bigger view of God than you do of the difficult relationship. Have a bigger view of God. One of the biggest problems in difficult relationships is that our view of God becomes so small, our view of people becomes so big. You gotta swap that out. People can't see all things, people can't know all things, they can't provide all things for you. What do you need? God can. Have a bigger view of God. Sometimes our view of God is so small that we forget God. And yet God knows the details. God's not worried. God's got the whole world in his hands. God is not caught off guard. People are. God is in control. We think we're in control. We're not. No matter how controlling we are, we're not even close to being in the same universe as the control God has in his sovereign will. We need to have a bigger view of God. Number two, don't make getting things done greater than showing others the love of Christ. Showing others the love of Christ is greater than getting things done. Jesus never says, and they will know you are my disciples by how much you got things done. And they will know that you are my disciples by how many checklists you accomplished. And they will know that you are my disciples by how many programs you had. They know you are my disciples by how many problems you could juggle really, really well. They know, right? Juggling is for clowns and entertainers, right? Not the church. They know you are my disciples by your love for one another. Show Christ's love. We'll accomplish stuff. We've got a roof on the building. Praise Jesus. They know we're his disciples 
by our love for one another. Number three, don't worship relationships. Worship God. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? We all have relationships that are good, people that we respect. We respect them so much. If we're not careful, that relationship can eclipse God, can it? It starts dictating what we do and how we think and how we interpret God's word and on and on and on. In the same way that a bad relationship can. We have relationships that we hope we never have again. They're so bad. But they can do the same thing. When everything around us has to submit to that experience that's so awful. We need to not let relationships dictate who we are and how we spend our time. Because the second they start dictating those kinds of things, and especially relationships we have now with people, they become idols. And something might become an idol before you even know it, and you don't realize it is. And when we have those idols in our lives, if we're not careful, we won't know how to get rid of them. So how we read the Bible, and how we spend our time, and how we spend our money, and people that we need to meet who are new, that we won't let in, can't see the grace of God in our lives. Because we've let another relationship that was good or bad dictate everything, and we worship it. So how do we tear it down? If you have an idol like that of a relationship, maybe in your past or one you have now, and it rules your life, how do we tear it down? We tear it down by treasuring Christ and the relationship we have with him. Because what makes our relationship with Christ better than all the other relationships we have is that the more we treasure Christ, the more grace we have to give to others. We become givers. So instead of taking from others what we desperately so want from them, we give. We give grace. We give hope, truth, perspective. And it's all pouring from our relationship with Christ. So we reorient our values, don't we? We tear down the idols of other relationships and replace them with our relationship we have with Jesus. If you're constantly tired of having unrealistic expectations of others, and you're constantly tired of people having unrealistic expectations of you, treasure Christ. Treasure Christ. That's how you tear down the idol of that relationship. If you're tired of being a constant taker, you can't seem to get enough from others. You just, you're taking, taking, taking. And you want to be a giver? Treasure Christ. Value Christ. Reprioritize your relationship with Christ and watch those idols tumble down. And be free. Be free. You can have new relationships with people that you may not know very well today, but you will. You're able to hang on and, and orient yourself to relationships of people you have in the past. Maybe they were good, maybe they were bad. I don't know. God does. But you're not letting them eclipse what God has revealed to you by his word in your relationship with Christ. And then watch God's unending mercies pour out into your relationships. There's nothing better, is there? I mean, what's better than seeing the mercy of God touch the life of another person through your relationship? It's all God's grace, isn't it? Because we're treasuring him and watching the power of the gospel transform our relationships before you know it. You can have a culture of healing around you that you didn't even think was possible. All because you're treasuring Christ and your relationship with him. Let's pray for that. Do you pray for that? Let's pray that we all treasure, tre value, treasure Christ and what he has done for us to have an eternal relationship that blesses us. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord Jesus, we pray that you help us treasure you more. Help us understand that you are with us. You see us, you provide, you establish a covenant of peace. We desperately want to be changed from our relationship with you so that all the difficult relationships we have, and we all have them, can be changed. Whenever we're guided by your spirit and allowing your grace to speak through our mouths and transform our attitudes, 
and reorient us to other people so that we can speak truth in love and point them to you and not be anxious or worry about how they relate to us. So help us become that kind of people. Do this for your name's sake. Let your kingdom come through us. We ask it in your name. We're trusting in you to do this for us. Amen.